Divine Truth Frequently Asked Question Session. Jesus, Mary and others provide answers to questions that are frequently asked by members of the media and public. This presentation is part of the Jesus Dealings series. Mary asked Jesus questions about arranging personal appointments with Jesus and whether he has favorite people whom he spends time with. Recorded on the 18th of November 2012 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session one. So can you tell me, do you have any followers? And if so, how many? <laughs> Um, the question of followers. Um, well, if, if you're asking whether I have people, there are people who follow the teachings that I teach or attempt to follow the teachings I teach, then I'm sure there are. <laughs> I don't know how many there are because I don't know how many people are attempting to follow the things that I teach. So my feelings are is I don't, I don't keep track of anybody who listens to the divine truth. People can come along to the seminars and come and come along to our website, listen to anything that we present in any of those forums. And we're not interested in how many people are listening. We're not interested in you know, what those people are doing in their personal lives. Obviously, we, we would just would like to share the divine truth with people in the world. And if lots and lots of people enjoy uh, listening to the truth, then that's what we're attempting to do, just to hopefully give them the truth that they can listen to and personally apply in their lives. We feel that a lot of people um, do attempt to apply the truth in their lives, but um, there are also a lot of people who come along to our seminars, and I've seen them come along to seminars for four years, and I haven't really seen them change very much at all in that time. So. It would, I would assume that they're not applying the particular truths that I'm teaching in their personal lives. But myself and Mary have very little to do in our day-to-day -day life with people who say that they are following the divine truth material. I don't feel that anyone follows me. In fact, I don't want people to follow me in the sense of me tell them what to do and then they, then they do what I say. I would like people to follow my example if, if, if everyone in the world followed my example, I feel that we'd have a very peaceful world and we'd also have uh, some very happy people who, living in the world as well. So um, in regard to the question of followers, I would love to have people to follow my example. I would love to have people to listen to the divine truth and follow the material in the sense of personally apply the material in their personal lives and develop a personal relationship with God. I definitely do not want people to listen to my words and follow my words without them having some kind of emotional and feeling based experience with God themselves. I would prefer to see that they have a personal experience with God and then they work their way through the issues with God and with their neighbour in, in terms of the issues with regard to a lack of love in their lives and, and then they practice those particular things surrounding love. That's what I would like them to do. Do you have any members? If so, how many? <laughs> Members. Um, well, myself and Mary, well, I actually personally own a organisation called Divine Truth um, that I've set up as a legal entity so that I can trade and so that I could have a website and other things. And the only member of that organisation is myself. Um, I'm the only director and I'm the only shareholder of that organisation. Um, we did have a God's Way of Love organization but that only had two members that had myself and Mary and uh, but very recently we closed down that organization I gave a talk recently in December of 2012 about closing down that organization in terms of having members in terms of some kind of church or some kind of organization other than what I've just stated we have no church there is no religion there is no organization so therefore there are no members there are no persons who are coming along regularly to some kind of service or some kind of church. And, and I, I personally do not ever feel like that will be the case. I feel that what will happen more and more is that people will listen to the divine truth. They'll decide for themselves whether they want to follow it in their personal lives or not. And as I keep teaching people, there is no need for them to go along to some kind of service or church or be a member of some kind of organization. And, uh, and we're not creating any organisations with any membership. So, so no, there are no members. 
and uh, and I have no idea how many people are listening to the divine truth around the world. Do you have a congregation or a church? <laughs> a congregation or a church? Well, no, I feel there are too many churches already on the planet, I think. From the last count, I think there's seven or 8,000 Christian religious uh, churches on the planet of different denominations. I feel that that is totally unnecessary. I do not want to create another one. Um, so no, there are no churches uh, that, that I feel that I would uh, like to individually support. Mind you, I feel that I'd like to support every church. I would like to bring the principles of divine truth to every church, to every organisation on the planet, in fact, every political organisation, every religious organisation, every economic organisation, every business, all needs to learn to practise the principles of divine truth if we really want to have a very happy planet. So, so I feel there is no need for me to create another organisation of my own. Instead, what I would like to do is just continue sharing the divine truth that we've discovered to the world and, and any persons in the world who would like to follow that can follow that in any way that they see fit. If they are members of a religion, then follow it in their religion if they would like to continue doing that. If they are members of a political party, then can, you know, do it with the political party that they're in. If they are members of some kind of business, then do it in the business, practice truth in their business. That's the way we see divine truth sort of spreading throughout the world not by Mary and myself creating another organisation and another religious organisation. We are often also asked whether we have prayer circles or prayer meetings or, and in fact, people are often very confused when they come to one of my seminars because they sort of expect me to pray over everybody before I begin or things like that. And those kind of things will never happen because I believe prayer is an individual discussion between a person and God. It should not ever be imposed upon another person, I believe. So, so I, do I do not ever see myself in the future saying prayers on behalf of others or prayers on behalf of a group. Only, only I will continue to pray for myself as, and as I encourage everybody else to do. And I also continue to pray for other people, but not in a formalized group based setting. I feel that all of those things are to do with control and also create a sensation of sort of holiness within the group of people. And, uh, and I feel that true holiness comes from practicing love in your own personal life and having a relationship with God that's independent of any other person on the planet or in the spirit world. So, so in terms of will we ever set up a congregation or a church? No, we will never set up a congregation or a church. I feel in the end, the earth is already God's congregation. Every person on it is one of God's children. And all we need to do is learn to love one another better, as well as come to receive divine love in an active manner so that we can understand more truth. Do you recruit followers or members or people to your cause? <laughs> do I recruit them? <laughs> Um, no, well, I know that's what I get accused of doing frequently, but there's nothing to recruit anybody to. So all we do is share divine truth, share what we believe is God's truth with the world. That's all we do. We don't do anything else. When other people accuse us of recruiting people, um, I can't see what, why the accusation even exists because we don't have any way of having a regular meeting with people. There's no regular groups. There's no regular congregation or organisation. There is no uh, organisation to become a member of. So there's no way to recruit anybody to anything. We do desire that people listen to the divine truth and, and, and if they desire to, to practice it in their personal lives. But we don't recruit people by marketing or, or advertising, all of that. All we do is present the truth to people who desire to hear it. That's all. And if a person desires to hear it and we have the time to share it, then we share it to the persons who desire to hear it. All of the things that we do on the internet with regard to the Frequently Asked Questions channel, the Divine Truth channel, it's all to do with sharing information with people. 
and we feel that people then have the ability and intelligence to listen to that information if they so desire and then decide to do something about the information if they also desire to do that. So we don't see that there's any need for us, in fact, to recruit anybody to, to have some great big worldwide organisation because at the end of the day, we feel that if everybody applies the material that we're teaching, everyone will have a personal relationship with God. They will automatically bring love into their lives, share love with others, share truth with others without there needing to be some kind of background organization to provide a motivation for doing so. So in the future, that will continue. We are not going to, con to recruit anybody. There's nothing to cr recruit anybody to. And we have no desire to make sure that we somehow attract lots and lots of different people uh, to some kind of membership organization. Do you tell people what to do in their own lives? <laughs> not, not at all. Um, obviously, a lot of people come to ask me what they should do in their own lives. And usually I tell them to go home and work it out for themselves because it's their life. And I only have the right to determine what happens in my own life. So my feelings are if people understood my teachings about free will and on the Internet, there are many videos now that I've placed connected to that question. And in fact, Quite recently, we did uh, an entire talk, uh, and in fact, I think it was two days of questions about free will. If people understood the points that we were making about free will, they would never come and ask me for advice about what to do in their own personal life. What they would do instead is that they would exercise their own free will in the manner that I've taught them to do, and come to some kind of relationship with God so that they can discuss all of their questions with God and receive answers from God about and direction from God and also direction from their spirit friends and guides who are in a, in a developed place of love and get all, get all of that information and collect all of that information and then decide using their own will what they should do in their lives. This is what I do in my personal life and this is what I am trying to or attempting to teach other people what to do with their personal lives. I do not encourage anybody going to one person to find out the answer to everything all the time. What myself and Mary are attempting to do is attempting to share divine truth with others so that people have a process by which they can interact with God and gain answers for themselves in their own personal life. They need to learn how to use their own feelings, their own emotions, their own assessment, their own logic, their own intellect, putting together all of the information that they've collected to make choices and choices and decisions in their lives that are based around love and truth. That's what they need to learn to do. I need to learn to do that. And everyone on this planet, I feel, needs to learn to do that. But I do believe on this planet there is a great deal of emotion about uncertainty. Most people have a lot of unanswered questions in their lives. And as a result, when they find somebody who they believe can answer most of their questions, they have a tendency to stop taking personal responsibility for their life and go to that person for the questions to be answered every time. Now, myself and Mary, strongly resist doing this with people. The reason why is because we, if we engage this process of telling people what to do in their personal lives and falling into this trap, I believe, of informing people what we notice about their personal lives all the time, then what happens is the people then become dependent upon us, which is the complete opposite thing of what we're trying to achieve. What we're trying to achieve is a group of people who are independent from others, completely reliant on their relationship with God for truth and completely in harmony with love in the manner in which they um, share and act and live that truth in their personal lives. Now, to have people like that, we've got to wean them off of any dependency and have them to be strong individuals with their own lives and with their own desires being permanently engaged, but being engaged in harmony with love and truth and humility. 
This is what we really want to achieve. So, so any person that comes to us asking questions about their personal lives needs to bear in mind that, that while they're asking me a question about their personal life, they've yet to grow up. When they are grown up, they'll have a relationship with God and they'll be asking God these questions about their personal lives and they'll be trusting their own decisions and their own, um, and also making their own mistakes with freedom and without fear. I feel what happens a lot of times on the planet is people are so afraid to make a mistake, they finish up making gurus to tell them what they should do because they're afraid to be personally responsible for their own lives. This is something that myself and Mary are completely against and we want it to instead encourage people to develop a personal responsibility for their own lives, to enjoy their own lives, even enjoy the process of making mistakes because you learn a lot from making mistakes and engage this process with God where they become reliant on God and not reliant on anyone else. The problem with reliance on other people is that other people cannot provide you as much information as what God can provide you. So it's like, do you ask, so the real question is this, do you ask a person who is limited, such as Jesus, a question, or do you ask somebody who is unlimited, such as God, the question? My feelings are, I would ask God, that's what I do. <laughs> I don't ask Jesus anything. I ask God a lot of questions and get the answers from God, and that's what I'm trying to encourage everybody else to do as well. Of course, this does not mean that I do not offer guidance at all to any person. If a person comes up to me asking for guidance, I will teach them the principles of divine truth that I have learned to the best of my ability. The problem though is that while I'm speaking just words to them, all they're hearing is just words. Unless they have some kind of personal life experience with God, what I'm saying to them will barely make any sense to them anyway and will barely help them to make any choices or decisions in their lives until they engage this personal relationship with God. So I'm not against giving people advice. What I'm saying though is that every time a person comes to ask for advice, they're demonstrating that they would like to be reliant on me rather than reliant on God first. Now, I understand that sometimes they might have tried to get the answer sorted out with God and they haven't found the answer for some reason. And I suggest that the reason why is because there's a complete lack of humility in their personal life because when a person is truly humble, they get the answers from God very, very rapidly. So if a person's not receiving the answers from God, they may come to me and asking for an answer. But part of me sort of goes, well, if you're not humble enough to receive the answer from God, then I doubt whether you're gonna be humble enough to receive the answer from me either, <laughs> bearing in mind that I'm just a person and God's much more powerful than I am. So, so again, I would like to encourage people to focus their attention and time and with this relationship with God, because that will provide them all of the answers necessary. So the way in which I give advice is that I give advice based on a set of principles and I do not tell them what they should do. But if they ask me, do you feel this is loving? I would definitely say quite categorically when, when it is not loving and why it is not loving or what behavior would be loving in comparison to what behavior isn't loving. And this is why I teach a lot of principles based, through, on, based on illustrations, because I feel illustrations of practical day-to-day -day living give us a lot of illustrations of how we are unloving on one side and how we're loving on the other side. And so quite frequently, I will give people practical demonstrations through their own life of how they've been unloving and how they've been loving, but it is still up to them what to choose to do with their own particular life and what their own desires and with their own passions. Do you attempt to control people's minds? <laughs> and I feel the only way to control a person's mind is to really feed them with their addictions. So what I see happening in day-to-day -day life around me is the television feeding the addictions of people, controlling their minds. I see the, you know, the news industry feeding the addictions of people often their fears, controlling their minds. Now, if sharing anything with a person is controlling their mind, then I suppose you could say, that's what I do. <laughs> but I don't, I don't agree with that. 
What I feel quite strongly is that sharing information with people is not controlling their minds. Controlling their minds is when you have a penalty associated with a person not following this particular information. Now, with regard to divine truth, there is no penalty upon a person if they do not follow the particular things that Mary and I teach. There are many people in our lives that do not follow anything to do with divine truth, and yet we still spend time with them. We still see them during the day. We interact with them. We still treat them with love and respect and kindness. And so we continuously interact with everyone around us based on the principles that we ourselves teach. Now, that is not controlling a person's life. Controlling a person's life would be to actually tell them something and then to tell them that something is going to go very bad if they don't do it. Or even worse, to have some kind of emotional blackmail that you place upon the person if they do not follow what you teach. There is no emotional blackmail that we can place upon a person without being out of harmony with our own teachings. All we can do is share the truths with others and allow them to make their own choices and decisions freely, however they wish. Now, if a person decides through their own personal choice to treat myself or Mary badly, and our definition of badly is that a person gets angry with us or they get demanding with us or they get needy with us or they try to maneuver or push us around in our own life or they try to manipulate us in some way, then we will just say to that person, we don't want to have anything more to do with you until you're willing to change your behavior. And if a person doesn't change their behavior in 20 years, then we won't see them for 20 years because we just don't want to spend our time with people with that kind of behavior. That is, in our opinion, not manipulating a person. That is allowing ourselves to make a choice about who is going to share our own life. So in answer to that, this question, I believe strongly that we need to allow people to have the freedom of their own choices, but when their choice is out of harmony with love of ourselves, then we are allowed to say to that person, we do not want you in our life anymore until you make a different choice. And that's how we act with people. Now, some people might call that mind control. I definitely do not call that mind control. I call that having a very strong viewpoint of what love is, and also a very strong consideration and respect for other people in their lives, but also just as much respect and consideration for myself and my own life. We, I know that many people believe that hypnotism is a way of controlling other people. I do not subscribe to hypnotism because I feel that hypnotism is a way of involving spirits in a person's life and I would never do that. So, so I do not agree with using hypnotism in any way except with the person themselves knowing that they are actually allowing themselves to become open to spirit control. And I personally do not agree with anybody allowing themselves to become open to more spirit control. Do you personally know the people who come to your seminars or who watch your YouTube videos? Do I personally know them? Well, the very first time I meet them, no, I don't personally know them. It's like we go and deliver seminars at new locations all around the world. Most of the time I've never met those persons before, except when they come to my first seminar. Now, of course, there are many people who come to lots of seminars because they like what they hear. And as a result of that, over that period of time, I get to know them a bit. And sometimes then they invite us out to dinner or we go out to a meal together or we do something, you know, recreationally together. So I get to know them a bit more. And sometimes they invite us around to their home and sometimes we go. Not all the time because we can't go to everybody's home who invites us. And so after a while, we do get to know people who come along to our seminars. And sometimes because people have come along for many years, we obviously know them quite well as a result of that. So, but that is only the subsequent result of them coming to the first seminar generally. We generally do not know people who come to the first seminar they've ever been to um, before they come. Most of the people who come to our seminars we've never met before and we've never 
you know, done any kind of pre-organization or some kind of pre-marketing to get that person to come to our seminar. So, so we have no real control over what happens with people or people's lives. And we often get to know people through the process of sharing this divine truth that we're sharing with the world. We, because we enjoy that so much and we enjoy most of the people we meet, we do finish up developing many friends as a result of having this divine truth available and giving divine truth to the world and sharing it in the manner in which we do. So what's happened over a period of quite a number of years now is we've, we've had many new friendships develop as a result of firstly, a person coming along to a seminar, then as they progress and grow, we find more and more that they, you know, we finish up spending a bit of time with them. If their desires and passions are very much along the lines of sharing divine truth with the world themselves, then often we spend more time with them as a result of that. And so we do get to know some of the people quite well and therefore become very good friends with them. Do you lock people away, put them through a process or remove them from general society in order to help them? Do we lock people away? <laughs> this is back to the compound idea, I suppose, is it? Um, well, Definitely not. Obviously, um, myself and Mary live in a, a one bedroom uh, home, which we're actually doing this recording in. And uh, there's no area to lock anybody away in the home. And uh, myself and Mary sleep in a tent, so it doesn't have a lock on it anyway. So <laughs> there's no locks there. Uh, we live in a, a in a area here in Wilkesdale that, that is on 40 acres. We have no fences. There's no way to control what people do. And to be honest, we feel quite strongly that if you need to lock a person up or, or put them in a room just to get them to feel something, then there must be a lot of resistance in the person to feeling their own emotions. We would rather teach them how to desire to feel themselves, how to desire God, how to desire love, how to desire humility, how to want to learn, and, and just let them decide whether they want to do that themselves rather than try to force them through a process that we feel quite frequently is very counterproductive to their own progression towards God. Obviously, if, if any organization or individual on this planet forces another person through some kind of process, they are automatically not working in harmony with the free will of the individual. It is far better to teach the person about the, how to act, to use their free will correctly. Now, the only time when I believe it is, it is possible or sh a person should be restricted is when they are taking actions that are blatantly out of harmony with love and are, and are violent in their nature. Now, I've discussed this quite a lot in the discussions that I did about the gift of free will that are on the Divine Truth channel. And rather than go into all the circumstances in this particular answer, what I would like to do is encourage people to watch that video about the gift of free will. There are times when we may desire to restrict somebody else in terms of what they do. And when I say we, I mean we as a society may decide to restrict somebody because of what they are doing and the damage that they are wreaking violently on others. However, I do not feel that it is wise to restrict anybody with regard to the expression of their emotions, unless that person themselves is already being controlled by another entity. And let me clarify that. If the person is being obviously controlled by a spirit and defined by medical profession today as psychotic in their behavior, then it would be wise to restrict the person until you could somehow work out what's going on. I'm not suggesting to medicate them. I'm suggesting to work out what's actually going on inside the person that causes them to allow another being, albeit a spirit, to control them and to help them work through the emotional issues as to why they allow this particular thing to happen, why they give up their free will. I believe that that is an essential part of their growth. So in answer to this question, I believe that it is not right to restrict a person's free will 
unless one, they are acting violently and out of harmony with love towards society or other individuals. Under those circumstances, you would, as a society, determine to restrict their will and re-educate them in some way through the use of their will as to how to use their will in a more loving and, and more controlled manner. The second way in which a person would perhaps need their will restricted is if they were becoming psychotic in their behavior, obviously being influenced by spirits or, or other entities, and, uh, and that particular person would need assistance to break the chain or the bond between the, themselves and that particular spirit entity. Now, I do not believe that exorcisms and other things that, uh, that Christian religions promote help with those things. There are very simple ways to remove people from the um, influence of other people in, and particularly from the influence of spirits. And that is by simply sharing the truth with them and, and helping them take personal responsibility for their own lives. And I feel that this can be done in a very nonviolent uh, and helpful manner and loving manner. And so I don't believe there are any times when a person should be restricted or should be put in a room or should be pushed into a process that they obviously do not want to engage before and you know that they do not want to engage before you begin. Now have I ever personally restricted the will of another? Uh, yes, I have personally restricted the will of another. For example, if a child comes up to me and hits me, the very first action I will take is I'll hold their arms and legs and I'll just continue holding them while telling them that it was wrong for them to hit me. And I will continue to restrict that child and restrict that child for as long as it takes for that child to go through its rage and its anger and all of the other emotions that it has and gets to tears. And then I will let the restriction go. That is the only time that I have personally restricted anybody and restricted anybody's behavior. The reason why I do that is I'm trying to teach the child that certain behavior, which is violent, is unloving and therefore unwelcome to anybody else in society. And a restriction placed upon the child is a way of informing the child that they cannot do this or take this action in the future. And if I continue to hold the child while they go through their rage and other experiences and they get to the point where they grieve about what, what they have done, then I know that they are now in the process of releasing the reason why they did it and therefore I can let the child go. And that is the only time that I have personally restricted anybody on the planet. <laughs> Do you encourage people to remove themselves from general society for their spiritual or personal development? With regard to personal development, I feel it is very, very important that we do not restrict ourselves from society or restrict ourselves from our life. There are times when we need privacy and there are times when it's great to involve other people in our lives. I do believe that there are times privacy is a requirement to actually develop love, truth and humility in our lives. But I feel that we need to learn to live our lives in the world. In the first century, I said quite clearly to people that you want, you want to be no part of the world, but live in the world. The reason why this is so important is because when you're living in the world, the law of attraction works perfectly and brings to you events that allow you to see where you're out of harmony with love and truth and allow you to work through these particular issues. If you remove yourself from society, remove yourself from your family, remove yourself from the friends, unless you have very strong reasons for doing so, and I feel the only strong reason is that those society, family or friends are acting violently towards you. Aside from that, you, there's very good reasons to engage your family, engage your friends and engage society in harmony with love and truth, because you will learn a lot during that process. And in the process of learning, you'll learn what love is, you'll learn what truth, the power of truth is, you'll learn more humility, you'll learn how to grow your soul. And the world that we live in is like this great big playground, reflecting back to ourselves, our own condition. And so when we live in the world around us, we have this beautiful ability 
to grow from the experiences that we have in the world around us. And this is what I feel anybody who restricts themselves from the world around them is, is preventing. So, so I do not agree with people who become religious, restricting themselves into their own religion, restricting themselves into their own faith, restricting themselves into a monastery, restricting themselves into some kind of uh, protected enclave, some kind of compound or something like that, because, because all of these things do not allow God's laws to act fluidly with the individual in helping the person change. God put us in the world so that we live in the world itself, so that we, so the world and every creature in it and every person in it reflects back to us what's going on and, and helps us to grow. This is a beautiful thing that God has done. And every time we close down or restrict our uh, world and we make our world smaller, we are actually restricting the potential for our own growth. So I feel it's very damaging to restrict the potential for your own growth. And the reason why it's damaging is because it slows down your own progression. And what you want, if you want to be developed as an individual and develop in love and develop in truth, is you want to progress as rapidly as you can, rather than slowing down your progression. So I would encourage everybody to share with the world everything in their life, with one exception, and that is when the world or people in the world or individuals in the world become violent towards yourself, where they attempt to restrict your own will, then al allow yourself to step away from those interactions. That's what personal love for yourself would do. But aside from that, spend time in the world. Enjoy following your desires and passions in harmony with love in the world. You will learn the most if you do this and you will learn the most rapidly as well if you continue to progress in this manner. Do you tell people they will benefit from what you teach? Yes, I definitely tell people they will benefit from what I teach. I have personally benefited from everything that I have learnt from God. And I believe that uh, if a person follows the principles of humility, love and truth and receives God's love, as I have done in my personal life, then I believe very, very strongly that they will benefit from, from what is taught. Of course, the, the personal benefit from what is taught will depend very much upon the person's willingness to practice it rather than just to listen to it. So what I find quite frequently is lots of people feel very attracted to listen to the divine truth, but not very attracted often to practicing the divine truth. And the reality is listening to it, while it may be beneficial in terms of allaying some of your fears and helping you understand some basic truths, it's not going to be beneficial very much to your life because your life choices are going to be dependent upon you acting upon truth, upon you acting upon love, upon you becoming a more humble person. So, so unless you practice the divine truth rather than just listening to it, you will not personally benefit from it. So I have seen many people come along to the seminars for many years, listen to lots and lots of different parts of divine truth, but some of those people, I've never seen them change the entire time that I've known them. Other people, I've heard them listen to one seminar and I've seen them change. And that is because some people have a desire to put into practice the principles they are learning and put into practice this relationship with God. What I'm finding is that a lot of people are attracted to divine truth for, for lots of different reasons, but not many people are willing to put into practice this relationship with God and develop their personal relationship with God. That's the thing that I believe will have the greatest benefit to their personal life. So what I would like to encourage people to do is yes, listen to the divine truth, listen to what we present, but don't just stop there. Because if you listen without putting anything into practice, all of the listening is a waste of your time. You might as well go away and listen to something else if that's the case. My suggestion is if you're going to listen to the divine truth, at least put a few of the basic principles in the practice and experiment with it for a bit. At least do that, because if you do that, then you will feel changes happen in your life and then it will personally benefit your life. I certainly promise to a person that it will personally benefit their life as long as they practice it sincerely. There's a lot of ifs in there, obviously. Um, if they practice it sincerely 
and if they take personal responsibility for their life, and if they become more humble, and if they receive divine love, and if they focus on more truth, it will definitely benefit their life. <laughs> but if you just come along and listen and do none of those things, then it won't have much benefit in your life at all. Do you attempt to create powerful emotional experiences for individuals so they then feel indebted to you? So I suppose we would have to firstly define in this question what a powerful emotional experience is. I believe that the majority of people are so shut down emotionally that they don't even know what a powerful emotional experience is. And in fact, the majority of people, when it, when it comes to crying for five minutes, for example, they feel that's too, that's too hard to do. The majority of people that I've met uh, in our seminars, just for them to cry for 10 seconds is an overwhelming emotional experience. Now, I feel that mankind's current definition of what is an overwhelming emotional experience is very, very limited. It's very limited because most people on the planet are attempting with all of their might to avoid any emotional experience that might overwhelm them. They only want to have good emotions too. They want to be selective. So they want to have emotions that are positive. They want all of those to be overwhelming, of course, but they do not understand that they also have a whole group of emotions that are negative, what they believe are negative, such as fear, shame, sadness, grief, those kind of emotions. And, and they do not want to be overwhelmed by those emotions at any time. Now, I believe for a person to become a whole person, they have to allow all emotion. They need to allow all of the positive emotional experiences and allow them at times to overwhelm them. And they also need to allow all of the negative emotional experiences and allow them to overwhelm them as well. Once they learn to expand emotionally, they won't be afraid of emotions. They'll also find clarity once they feel emotion. So I definitely do encourage people to feel their emotions to get to a point of clarity with about, about how they feel. Now, if you're saying, do I want to create that in my seminars? No, I don't. The reason why I don't want to create that in my seminars is because the seminars are not the best place for a person to feel their emotions. The best place for a person to feel their emotions is, is, in, is in the privacy of their own location or their own home or their own protective environment. That's the best time for them to feel their true emotions. So what I would prefer people to do is to, to feel their emotions fully, particularly all of their negative emotions, to feel all of their negative emotions fully in that environment. The more they do that, the less of those emotions they'll carry around with themselves in their day-to-day -day activity, in their day-to-day -day life. And as a result of that, they'll have more emotionally positive experiences in their day-to-day -day activity, in their day-to-day -day life. But I do not feel that society needs to be afraid of these so-called negative emotions. Society does not need to be afraid of grief as much as it is. Society does not need to be afraid of even the emotion of fear or the emotion of shame. You know, none of these emotions, we do not need to be afraid of any of these emotions because all of these emotions are a natural part of the human experience. And as we allow their release from ourselves, we have less and less of them. So I encourage people to connect emotionally. Now, in my seminars, I finish up stating truths to people about their personal lives. The reason why is that when a person asks me questions, they will often ask me a question about their personal life. And so I will make a statement to them about their personal life. Now, the statement of truth given to another person often causes that person to feel an emotion. And as a result of that, in that particular moment, they are overwhelmed by the emotion of somebody stating the truth to them about their personal life. That is what often does happen in a seminars. And that's why often people in the seminars have a finish up having a tear or two. Now I would call it having a tear or two, not being overwhelmed emotionally, because if they are truly going to allow themselves to feel the grief of their personal experience, they will find they might need to cry for an hour or two about that particular thing that I've mentioned to them for a few minutes, rather than just having a few dribbles coming out of their eyes uh, while I'm speaking to them about it. 
I believe those people need to revisit what I've said to them, go home and feel the experience of what I've said to them. And the, the reason why they need to do that is if they feel the experience, they will release the emotional memory of the experience from themselves and then they will feel more love, more truth, more secure, more safe. They'll have less grief and so forth. So that's what I would encourage people to do. And that's what I do encourage people to do. People in your group seem to have many emotional experiences. The media claims you do this in order to open up a person emotionally to your own control. Is this true? It's interesting, that question, because I find the media very manipulative on, in regard to this question. Because the media is constantly manipulating the fear of people in order to sell more magazines, sell more books, sell more TV space, sell more advertising space and so forth. And yet at the same time, they accuse me of being manipulating by stating the truth to people. Now, I also see the media stating lies to people in order to manipulate the emotion of fear. And they are accusing me of manipulating people by stating the truth to people. I find this a very, very manipulative uh, question, actually, from on behalf of the media. My feelings are this. If I was attempting to manipulate people's emotions by speaking lies to them, by threatening them, by blackmailing them, just as the media does, then I would definitely be a very manipulative person, just as the media are very much generally like. However, I do not do that. What I do instead is I speak the truth to people. And the truth does open people up emotionally. This is the important thing about truth, is it helps them work through issues of their own like personal lives. This is a very, very important part of personal development. So my focus in my seminars is to speak the truth to people. If the people have an emotional response to that truth, then that is their emotional response. I haven't attempted to manipulate that response. I do not need them to have an emotional response. Although often I know they will have one because I've stated the truth to them, a truth which they feel inside, which, have, but which they have never allowed themselves to experience. So quite frequently that happens during my seminars. This is very, very different than taking the media uh, type of action, which is to state a heap of lies or mistruths or distortions of truth to people in order to manipulate their fear into doing something. That is definitely not what I agree with and I definitely do not do that myself. The media itself believes that when people are open emotionally, they are open to manipulation and control. I actually do not agree with this at all. I feel when a person is completely open emotionally, such as I am generally, you are completely unable to be controlled. The only time you can be controlled is when you're trying to suppress certain emotions. If I can give an example of this, if I am trying to suppress fear, let's say I'm trying to suppress a certain fear that I'm afraid that my mother never loved me. Let's say I'm afraid of that. Then every time somebody, somebody externally says to me, perhaps your mother didn't love you or your mum does love you, they can manipulate me in any direction. They can state one thing or the other thing and I can be manipulated because I'm shutting down the emotion, my, my emotional experience. Now, if I've gone through my emotions and I've realised that my mum doesn't love me, for example, that she's shown me through years and years of activity of hatred and other emotions she's projected at me and the different ways in which she acted towards me all the way through my childhood, spanking me all the time, hitting me all the time, verbally abusing me all the time. And I would come to recognise that that's not love. And if I came to recognise that wasn't love and I grieved that and let go of that grief, I can forgive my mother for her behaviour towards myself and from that moment on, I am unable to be manipulated about my mother because I know the truth. So I'm unable to be manipulated by somebody saying your mum really did love you or somebody saying your mum really hated you 
I can't be manipulated in either direction because I now know the truth because I've allowed myself to personally experience it. Let's look at another example. Let's say I had some fear in my life. Let's say I was afraid of, of heights, just a simple uh, fear of a physical thing. If I hold on to this fear, then somebody can manipulate me with my fear of heights. They can manipulate my behavior and my choices and my decisions because I am afraid of heights. But if I let go of my fear of heights through an emotional process, which will probably involve my parents and other emotions, once I work my way through these particular emotions about my fear of heights, once I've released my fear of heights completely, nobody can manipulate me through my fear of heights. They can put me on a high mountain and I won't be afraid. They can put me on the ground. I won't be afraid. They can stand me on a chair. I won't be afraid. They can take me on a plane. I won't be afraid because I can no longer be manipulated by the fear because the fear is now out of me. So the only time a person can truly manipulate me is if I hold on to an emotion without feeling it and releasing it. That's the only time they can manipulate me. Now, the media manipulates people that way all the time. What they do is they encourage people to live in their fear rather than releasing their fears. They do this by causing, by stating a lot of things that are happening around us to us over and over again, telling us that we should be afraid. And I'm saying to people, no, no, there's no such thing as you should be afraid. Once you release your fear, you will not be afraid of anything. You won't even be afraid of death once you release your fear. You won't be afraid of being harmed once you release your fear. You will engage your life in a perfectly desirous and, and passionate manner because you are no longer afraid of all of these external things happening. So it is very different what the media are doing. What the media are doing is they are manipulating the fear and trying to help the fear inside of people grow while what I am trying to do is help people release their fear and have the fear inside of them get smaller, reduce in size, because I know that when it reduces in size, they will have a more happy, desireful life, um, which is very, very different to having a more fearful life. <laughs>